Our second lesson for today is from the Gospel. It's the Gospel of Mark. It's the ninth chapter. It's the second to the ninth verse. Hear with me now the Word of God. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments became glistening, intensely white, as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is so well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of this cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down a mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man should have risen from the dead. May God's blessings be on the reading of his most holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. I told you last week of a production of Jesus Christ Superstar I participated in six years ago now, and I think the most creative aspect of the production was the professional dancer who, having decided to dress herself in white as an angel, floated quietly and aimlessly around the congregation as the action was going on as they were presenting the life and the gospel of Jesus. But then, when Judas betrayed Jesus, suddenly she reappeared as a black angel, and she had a lovely, a long black wisp of cloth, which she very cunningly danced, and danced around the room with it as if to say, I am here now, Judas. I'm in charge now. And her dancing intensified, and the dancing intensified, until finally the other black angel suddenly appeared, and they bodily picked up Judas, and they carried him down the aisle of the sanctuary, all to the, while the choir was singing, So long, Judas. And she had that characteristic smile on her face as they sang. It's the same smile that she has on her face whenever any of us in our lives act like Judas or when we settle our faith for less. Less than the transforming, transfiguring love of God. And so I have entitled this sermon today, When We Settle for Less. Oh, Whitney, Whitney, Whitney. If anyone had been to the mountaintop of success, a hundred million dollars worth of fame and fortune, the American idol of her time, at least in my generation, her humble beginnings in a church choir just like this one. <coughs> she had a dream, however, to go up that mountain which she followed, but which mountain did she climb? That mountain she climbed was a lot of strenuous effort on her part. It was a lot of seriously serious work, but unfortunately the end came at a very high price. We will all miss her amazing talent. May she rest in peace. Mm -hmm. That amazing voice that shook the world is silenced. But the fact remains that with me, with all the world at her fingertips, she settled for less. And I know of which I speak. Those who have ever seen talented and capable loved ones die from drug addictions, they know the loss her family is experiencing this day. They know, I know. But the mountaintops of life are part of the human quest. We all have our mountaintops in life to climb. 
whether they are real or whether they are imagined. But it's the spiritual mountaintops that are the topic of discussion this morning. And it's how we handle them when we come in contact with them that is the issue. And today, Jesus is on his and he helps us reflect on ours. A mountaintop that amazes us and it terrifies us at the same time. Now, Peter was understandably awestruck. It was to have been a quiet retreat. It was to be a time apart from the crowds. But an extraordinary event was unfolding, a moment that was so sacred in history. And Peter, uh, as vice president in charge of doing something all the time, he had to do something. So he proposed building a booth or a kiosk or a shrine, whatever you want to call it, to preserve the moment. And we're not told how he was going to do this, whether he had a hammer and a saw at the ready. You know, it's, it's hard to come up with something when all you have is a sewing needle in your fisherman's belt. But then Peter was never one to let details get in the way of his dream. And a cloud appeared at that moment before Peter could throw himself into anything and out of a cloud of voice said, this is my son, this is my beloved, listen to him. Peter wanted to keep the moment from passing, was in danger of passing the moment. Now we have to stop and think what was going on there, on that mountain. Number one, it was a tantalizing glimpse into the divinity of Jesus once and for all. The contrast of looking at Jesus as this humble carpenter and a teacher, he became trans spectacularly transformed, all the while surrounded by the two of the greatest prophets, Moses and Elijah. Now, that undeniably linked Jesus to the last 1,500 years of their history, and there was no doubt that Jesus was seen at that moment as a blessed divine figure. He's given a Shekinah, which is a great light, the same as Moses received. And anyone witnessing that knew that this was the best of God's glory, and the best was yet to come. But contrast this, what we already know about Jesus as a human being. And it goes back to what I said earlier. It's not the mountaintop experiences that cause the problem. It's how we handle them when we come in contact with them. Do we embrace those moments for the mystifying, fantastic spiritual experiences they are? Do we grow from them? Do we learn from them? Or do we like Peter, Peter do we like Peter settle for less? Why do we in our lives always frame everything in winning and losing? Now let me ask you a question this morning. What really is success. Is it a hundred million dollars? Is it the name that can be dropped to three billion people worldwide? Or is it an unshakable belief in a God who loves us enough that when things go badly in our lives, when it all falls apart, that he can take us by the hand, he can show us a better way. Do we settle for Jesus, or do we settle for less? And my friends, I stand before you humbly this morning to say that none of us are spared the temptations of this world. None of us! Is there a part of me that, according to the secular success model, wants to see this congregation reach huge numbers of people? Is there a part of me that wants to see this gospel broadcast as far and as fast as possible? Do we want to see developing church programs that thrive and grow? Do we want to have a harmonious, beautiful, forward-looking, upward-thinking church, home for worship, and a mission that reflects that taboo? I will be the first to admit it. Yes, there's that part of me that wants that. But I, too, am here to tell you that I settle for less. When I, for one minute, forget the most important focus, what Jesus himself showed us he was truly all about. Jesus didn't set up a center for Jesus' teaching that could pull in students and wisdom seekers from all over for weekly seminars that he provided room and board for. 
Jesus chose to wander the countryside. He hardly spent the same night in the same place. Twice, and crowds always were following him to catch him up. Instead of organizing a hierarchy for training scores and scores of followers, Jesus only chose 12 disciples, and he gave them on the road destruction. And instead of playing up his miraculous strengths, the wonder and the power of his true identity, Jesus chose to be anonymous most of the part. As a simple, dusty craftsman, as a rabbi, and a house swords leader was constantly telling everybody and his disciples not to tell anyone what they had seen. Now why? Why did he do that? Because there really is no such thing as failure or success for Jesus. Jesus never worried about struggling up or sliding down a ladder. Jesus was only concerned with lowering himself to the knee and extending his hands for God's service. And we, this morning, are compelled to do the same. If success is a ladder, then service is a chute and a carpet, a chute of free-falling grace, and a magic carpet because it can continue to unfurl and unfold without end. Committed to a life of service means parachuting into the war zones of this world with a welcome mat of God's love and sacrifice to the door of every home and every heart that has need. This is the mission Jesus affords us. Downwardly mobile, forward reaching service, not upward struggling success that may lead to burnout, addiction, and death. Successes are things that can be calculated. Service is never quantified. In Jesus' parable of the sower, we are called to plant the seed, but none of us can guarantee the harvest. As mere humans, we cannot possibly know the results of our sowing until the eternal harvest, which is brought about by God. We will be judged not by the results of the harvest, but by the sincerity of how we sow the seed. You know, a prophet came to a city, and he delivered this message every day in the marketplace. And after a time, his reigning became a fixture in the city's marketplace, and nobody was listening. They thought it was rather amusing. And finally, this little boy, he pitied the old man. He approached him, and he said, Sir, why do you keep crying aloud your message every day, every year, year after year? The people here will never listen to you. He replied, I gave up hope that they would listen to me a long time ago. But I go on crying, lest I begin to listen to them. When we settle for less. To the glory of God. Amen.